Good morning. We have uh, with us uh, Marvin Olaski with us. Hello. Uh, how are we doing? We're doing fine. Good. Okay. Glad to be in Scotland. Good. And you're just telling me that it's your first visit? Correct. To Scotland and you're, you're here with your lovely wife? Yes. Yes. Who is of Scottish ancestry. Okay. And so we will be uh, trotting perhaps some of the same ground that her great-great-grandparents taught. Okay. So. And not yourself? You, you have any, any Scottish ancestry in no, your... No, I would like to say so, but uh, not a bit. No, nothing. So it's just your wife yes. connecting with her ancestors. Um, and um, tell us a little bit about yourself, because actually until this morning and actually till yesterday, Katie mentioned I'll be doing this podcast with yourself. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually know a lot about you until I actually typed your name into Google and you're actually quite a big name. Uh, in, in certain circles, uh, <laughs> some, some notoriety. But... Uh, I grew up in uh, Boston, went to, went to school in New England, uh, um, became a uh, professor at the University of Texas for many years, and uh, for the past 27 years I've been uh, editing a magazine called World, okay. which, is, which has an ambitious title, mm -hmm. uh, but we do try to cover a little bit of everything, both in the United States and then, and then mm -hmm. around the world, and we have some bureaus in uh, East Asia and Africa. and. Uh, uh, we we cover movies and music and books mm -hmm. and uh, politics. Uh, so um, you know, every two weeks we come up. And we have probably about a half a million American readers and perhaps even a few in Scotland uh, yeah. by by uh, uh, over the internet. Yeah, so. well, I'm going to subscribe now. Excellent. So I'm well, going to sign good. up. So All right. Very interesting. It does seem to cover everything. Um, yeah, and we and we try to cover everything from a from a Christian perspective. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, we believe in in, uh, in biblical objectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, God is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world, and so uh, he knows what the world is really all about. And we learn about that by reading the Bible. Uh, and um, uh, then we try to interpret everything in terms of God's word. So uh, it's very different from other American magazines like Time or so forth, or, or different from The Economist, mm -hmm. a, a magazine I... I read and, and enjoy, but uh, coming that's coming from a from a strongly secular worldview, and we very explicitly come from a Christian worldview. And so, all the writers are, are believers. Um, on all the on all the writers are, are believers, uh, evangelicals. Okay. Um, and um, uh, the editors are uh, actually we do we do have a uh, uh, a reporter in Africa who's Catholic, uh, but all the the regular writers are evangelicals, and we try to explain everything. And, and we also have a basically, uh, at least our editors, from a reform perspective. Okay. So uh, yeah. uh, I'm actually an, an elder in the Presbyterian Church in America, mm -hmm. which is, uh, uh, I suspect, equivalent in some ways to the free church here. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you've got actually a quite an interesting testimony. So would you mind just oh. sharing with our podcast well, this, uh, yes, this a is, little bit about how you came to Christ? Yes, a, a notorious testimony in some ways. <laughs> because, uh, uh, I grew up in uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, in a Jewish family, uh, and is uh, it's not unusual in America right now. Bar mitzvah at age thirteen, atheist mm. at age fourteen. Okay, uh, and that's what I was. Read uh, I read Sigmund Freud and thought that all religion is just uh, uh, an illusion, and uh, you know a, a childhood faith in a human father then transferred to some mythical god in the sky. So you read that at thirteen. Uh, probably 14, 14. Wow. Or so. okay. uh, I, had a, I had a brother who was three years older who uh, uh, helped me uh, uh, get into, uh, into deviant politics. I was, I was still on the sort. Beano at that point. <laughs> okay. Right, right. Uh, and, then, and then actually uh, uh, from, the, from the UK, H.G. Uh, Wells yeah. had a history of the world that he published in 1920, uh, but I caught up to it in the, uh, uh, in the 1960s. And... Uh, very strongly atheistic point of view, uh, coming straight from Darwin, and and we come out of the slime, and uh, and then we we progress as human beings. So uh, the myths from two thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, we should just ignore. This is childish yeah. stuff. We've we've progressed since then. Mm -hmm. So I think H.G. Wells and Sigmund Freud are the two people I could blame. Well, the person I can most blame is myself mm -hmm. because, you know, I I did not want to believe in a god at that point. I just wanted to be a god unto myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to uh, uh, I went to Yale University and became even more of an atheist there. And then these were the years in the late 1960s of, of the Vietnam War, uh, and there was an anti-war movement in the United States I was very much a part of. Uh, so I kept moving to the left and uh, became a Marxist in college. 
actually, um, and this, this seems incredibly silly to me right now, but uh, uh, when I was 22, I joined the Communist Party okay. of the United States and uh, traveled uh, uh, across the Pacific on a Soviet freighter, went across the Soviet Union on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, was going to basically become a Soviet agent. Uh, in God's providence, that didn't happen. <laughs> I eventually uh, went to graduate school, and in the course of graduate school, not due to my professors, but due purely to God's grace, I became a Christian. Okay. Was there, were there people who were influential in that, or was that just you picking up the uh, Bible? Or? People, people who died 300 years ago. Okay. Uh, the, the Puritans, yeah. uh, basically, uh, both, both English Puritans and then American Puritans, like Increase Mather and Jonathan Edwards. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, became a Christian when I was 26. Uh, started going to, uh, well, eventually started going to a church just to find out if there were still people who believed what these folks 200 years ago <laughs> believed. And uh, I started out in a, in a conservative Baptist church. Uh, then uh, through a long set of circumstances, providential circumstances, uh, uh, met a, uh, a Presbyterian pastor who was very helpful to me at that mm -hmm. point. And uh, uh, we went into a bookstore and, and he said, well, you need to read this, uh, uh, the two volume Calvin's Institutes mm -hmm. of the Christian Religion. And you some, need to read Charles some Hodge. Some easy stuff. And, and so, yeah. and so, <laughs> some light uh, stuff. Yeah, so, so I, I came out of the, of the bookstore with, uh, with no money left, but uh, lots of books, which were very <laughs> helpful. Uh, so became became reformed, became a Presbyterian mm -hmm. at that point, and that's where I've been now for the past 43 years. And uh, uh, also been, this was happening at the same time, uh, uh, my wife, uh, we met, we got married. She came, she had come from a very, a very theologically liberal United Methodist background. Okay, the opposite. Uh, yeah, the opposite in some ways, but similar in some ways, so that uh, uh, oddly enough, as we were moving towards, uh, towards Christ, or as Christ was dragging us towards mm -hmm. him, I was throwing Christian books at her, uh, coming from my, from my Jewish background, she coming from a United Methodist background, we had a long way to come, both of us, in different mm -hmm. ways. And we ended up uh, through God's kindness together. And so we've been married all this time and been uh, got some learning. Kids. Got some we have we have four four, uh, kids. four sons uh, who are now all married. We are glad nice. to say, and Amen. they are uh, doing their function in life of, mm -hmm. of producing grandchildren. For us. So, uh, <laughs> so we have five grandchildren right now, and we hope for more. So uh, yeah, it's been it's been uh, I'm, I'm very thankful. Uh, uh, while I was still. Not just, a, not just a sinner, but a very vicious sinner mm -hmm. who was a communist and trying to convince mm -hmm. people there's no God. Yeah. Uh, God, in his, in his mercy, uh, came after me. Praise and, God for uh, his grace. So, yeah. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, you, uh, so when you came to Christ, um, I was reading a little bit about your background. You were involved with um, the world of politics for a while. Involved with in right? politics for a while. Uh, but... Uh, Involved primarily because, well, reading the Bible, I, you can't you can't miss the importance of uh, trying to help widows and orphans mm -hmm. and uh, others who are in difficult straits. Uh, so, uh, I was I was working as a uh, as a professor, a history professor, mostly journalism history, mm -hmm. uh, but also got interested in the history of poverty fighting in America. Okay. And the uh, the history books that I got out of the uh, of the University of Texas Library. You would think that uh, there was never any poverty fighting in America until the 1930s when government got involved, the federal government became okay. involved in, with the New Deal. Mm. Uh, and I just thought, well, if I'm reading the Bible here in the, uh, uh, in the 1980s and I am being uh, affected by it, uh, thinking, well, this is a real challenge to me personally. What, what, can I, what can I do? What should I be doing? Then probably in the 18th and 19th century when Americans on average read the Bible more, uh, they also would have been affected in some way. Mm -hmm. So I just thought there must be a history here of Christian poverty fighting in America that just has not been told mm -hmm. because none of the books I read, the standard, the standard history books, uh, they even dealt with that. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to spend a year uh, on leave from the University of Texas in uh, Washington, D.C. in the Library of Congress, which has many, many volumes. And uh, in, the, in the stacks of the library, I mean, literally I was blowing dust off these papers that had probably been there for 100 years that were records mm. of Christian charitable organizations. Mm -hmm. And I read more of that, read what they did, their case studies, their, their stories, started looking at old newspapers and finding stories about that, and eventually uh, uh, wrote, a, wrote a book called The Tragedy of American Compassion, yeah. uh, which came out in 1992, 
which was really the history of, of Christian charity in America and told the story of how the church has got it right mm -hmm. in terms of offering help to people that was challenging and personal and spiritual, mm -hmm. not just material help and not just, uh, not just, not just enabling them to, uh, to be on the dole, mm -hmm. but actually challenging people to come out of poverty and, and uh, believe in God and believe that they're created in God's image and therefore God's creative, they're creative, uh, God does wonderful things, they in God's image can also do wonderful mm -hmm. things. And this is, there was a lot of poverty fighting like that in the United States in the, 19, in the, in the 18th century and the 19th century and it helped people come out of poverty. Okay, so um, you just explain for everyone what that term, we don't really use that term in the UK, poverty fighting. So what, what would, how would you explain that? Well, two, two different ways. Uh, the, the, uh, the historical way in the United States was uh, through church efforts. And churches had deacons, the deacons, in some ways taking after Thomas Chalmers. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they learned, American poverty fighters learned from Thomas Chalmers, okay. the people in yeah. churches. So they saw what he had done in Glasgow in the 1820s, and they wanted to do the same. So they set up often parish systems. They had uh, deacons who were responsible for understanding the neighborhoods, uh, understanding the needs of people. And uh, they would uh, work with people uh, in, a, in a challenging way, rather than just giving them money, they would say, well, uh, if, there's a, if there's a homeless shelter uh, and a person came to it uh, and the man was able-bodied, they would say, here, here's an ax. We have a wood pile next door. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you chop wood for an hour or so? And that will, uh, that will help us uh, have fuel for our stove, for our oven to cook food, for heating. Uh, you're capable of doing that, and then you can come and, and stay with us for a few days, and we'll help you find a job. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll look at what skills you have, what experience you've had, uh, and we'll, we'll try to help you to become a, a functioning person in the community, mm -hmm. not, just, not just a person who's, uh, who's a beggar, mm -hmm. but a person who can actually make a contribution. So it's not just, they, it wasn't just giving out food, it wasn't and just, just giving out, hand out, it was actually no, helping they would ask the ball of the, life. If the person were able-bodied, if mm -hmm. the man were able-bodied, they would say, here, please chop wood for an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were teaching, a, they were doing two things like that. Number one, it was a work test. They wanted to see if the person was willing to work rather than just coming and, and being a taker. Mm -hmm. And if the person was willing to work, they said, well, we are willing to work with you. Uh, we will help you, we will help you. Here's, here's a place to stay, here's food. Uh, in the next few days, we'll help you look for a job and something you can do. And, and then also, not only was it a work test, but they were saying to the person, you are, you are capable of helping yourself and helping others as well. Mm -hmm. Because there are people who are here who are disabled, they are unable to chop wood. So you'll be helping them mm -hmm. as you help yourself and as you help the whole community. So they were trying right away to test the person, but also try to teach by that process that, that you can help others. Mm -hmm. uh, women often, there were sewing rooms and they weren't asked to chop wood, but they were, uh, if they were capable of sewing, uh, they, would, they were told, well, here, here's a place and you can sew some clothes uh, for yourself, uh, for your children, uh, but for other people who are victims of hurricanes or earthquakes or other disasters, we'll send some of the clothes to them. And so again, trying, trying to teach, teach that you can help others mm -hmm. uh, and, and not, just, not just be a taker, you can also be a giver. Yeah, yeah. So that was integral to American church charity work. And these were works that were largely set up by evangelicals, but there were also Catholic works, there were Jewish works, uh, as immigrants came into New York and Boston and other cities. Uh, and, uh, and run by the local church in the run, run by the local yeah. church or by Christian organizations that were, par that were parachurch, that yeah. a number of different churches contributed to. Mm -hmm. And they would have uh, uh, boards of directors of, of uh, uh, both pastors and elders and deacons and, and other lay people. Uh, and this was, this was the normal everyday practice in the United States when churches were responsible for charity and for the most part, uh, I looked at the records of, uh, of many, many cities in the 19th century. For the most part, they did a very good job. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, were uh, instrumental in, particularly with immigrants coming in, in helping the immigrants come into America and uh, work for themselves, build families, build churches. So it was a very successful program. Uh, there were sometimes people who were not helped. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the early 20th century, you see uh, uh, governmental social workers coming along. They, this was the beginning of social work as a profession. And, and they said, well, yes, we see that the churches are doing a good job with 80% uh, with of the people, but there are 20% others. If you have government taking over and doing it, then government can reach 100%. 
we can do what the churches did, but we can have complete coverage all across the board. And so you see, particularly in the 1930s, when you have the Great Depression in the United States, as well as in the United Kingdom, yeah. uh, churches were hard pressed economically, and there were uh, people in the government who said, well, we'll take over all this, mm. uh, and we'll start doing it, uh, and, and you don't have to worry about fundraising, we will do it, and you can work with us, and uh, yes, we'll develop certain rules and procedures, but that's okay, mm. we'll all work together. Mm. And for a while it did work, it was helped, uh, helpful, I think, in the 1930s, in the 1960s, you saw an escalation of that in the United States in what was called the, the Great Society uh, of, Lyndon, of President Lyndon Johnson, lots of anti-poverty work of that sort, took it over from the churches uh, and in the process in many ways ruined it mm -hmm. because uh, it started looking at people as a, not, not, as, not as people with both spiritual and material needs, but as people with material needs only. Yeah. And uh, after a while, uh, the more government did, church people said, well, we're being taxed for it, uh, uh, we have to pay the welfare system, and so we're not gonna work that hard ourselves out, let the government do it. Some churches tried to keep doing it and were successful, other churches just gave up, and um, government started doing it, uh, which in, in some ways, uh, there, was, there was material help, but the spiritual part of it just disappeared. Yeah. And increasingly, the churches were told and people were told, you can't, you can't raise spiritual questions with people. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. And so it just became a question of transferring mm -hmm. material resources. And as a result, you've had in the United States uh, very often uh, multi-generational welfare dependency. Mm -hmm. Parents Sounds and children and so forth. So, so sim similar mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why I, ca I call this history book the tragedy of American compassion. Okay. Yeah. Tragedy is when, uh, is when uh, 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 you know, you, you, you have your wax wings in, in, in Greek mythology and you fly up higher and higher until the sun melts your wings and you plummet down and die. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the story, I believe, of, of, of Icarus. Uh, that's a tragedy. A tragedy is when you, you see something good, you want to do more of it, but you overreach and, and that's the end. And, and that's, we've had this overreaching, often from very good intentions in the United States and probably the UK as well. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you have uh, more more despair and and uh, and and people who need both the spir spiritual material help only get material help, and it doesn't work. Yeah. So, do you think <coughs> um, do you think the churches in uh, the U.S. as you look around uh, at, the, at the different churches that you're involved with and that you have contact with, do you think that um, they are lacking in this area of if you want to put it in this kind of terms, poverty fighting. Yeah, and, and perhaps think, poverty fighting the isn't the right term, yeah. in, in, in Christian charity. Yeah. Um, that uh, there, are, there are churches in the United States that, that do this very well. I've visited a number of them and been very impressed with what they do. Uh, others have just said it's the government's job in a sense of, uh, I've paid at the office, I've paid my taxes, let's have the professionals do it. Mm -hmm. But the professionals in the United States, uh, and, and again, many of them uh, uh, very well-intentioned, uh, very desirous of helping, but the social workers have caseloads of, say, one to 100. Uh, and, they, and, and so many young social workers, uh, after a couple of years, they say, well, I came into this to help people. All I'm doing is shuffling paper, and I'm treating people as numbers or... Uh, in some ways, and I don't mean this at all in a derogatory way, as animals. Uh, uh, my wife and I have a dog at home. Uh, uh, he's not a work dog. Uh, he's not a show dog. He's a dog we enjoy walking with him, but uh, we, we take long walks with him a couple of times a day. The rest of the time, he pretty much lies around, and we put some food in his bowl, some water mm -hmm. in his bowl. Uh, he's a dog. Mm -hmm. uh, we enjoy him. He, he enjoys being fed. Uh, we don't expect anything more from him. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, uh, uh, Charity in the United States has, has become almost treating people like our dog. Mm -hmm. Put some food in their bowls. Uh, we don't expect anything from you. Uh, you, can, you can just sit around all day. That's not a way to treat human beings. Mm -hmm. Human beings are not animals. Human beings are created in God's mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we've just lost so much as we've, as we've uh, expanded and, uh, and become professionalized. Mm -hmm. uh, when I looked at the records of these Christian charitable organizations in the 1880s and the 1890s and so forth, uh, they typically had uh, 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 one volunteer for every two people that they were helping. Uh, they actually had personal, challenging personal and spiritual help. 
you can do a lot that way. Uh, you can't do much if, uh, if people just become numbers and you're just putting some food in their bowl. Mm -hmm. So what do you think needs to, what do you think needs to change um, in the US in terms of how the church responds to, to poverty in maybe their communities or maybe communities where there is a lot of poverty but there's not a lot of church influence? Yep. Uh, well, I mean, in the churches, we have to feel that, that uh, we should not just leave this to the government. We should not just leave this to professionals. Uh, this is something that all of us are, are called to help. Mm. Widows and orphans, uh, uh, prisoners, uh, 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 people, uh, immigrants coming in. Uh, this, is, this is the duty of all of us. Now, it's hard to do when um, the, the, there, there's an expression in the United States for, uh, of, of economists, bad charity, bad Bad money drives out good. I won't go into the whole derivation of that, but the the parallel of that in, in charitable work is bad charity drives out good. That uh, if someone is used to uh, just getting a dole and not working for it, then the person starts to feel entitled. Mm -hmm. uh, why should I work for this? Uh, uh, my neighbors aren't working for it. They're getting this. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to work. Uh, that's, that's bad charity, mm -hmm. the charity that just treats people as animals rather than human beings. That tends to drive out the good charity, where you're actually treating people as, as made in God's image. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very hard struggle when you have such a, such a large governmental welfare system. The, uh, the, the, the plan uh, back in the, uh, in the 1990s, uh, I worked a little bit with a, a, a governor of Texas who was then running for president, uh, George W. Bush, mm -hmm. who's a, a, a Christian. I, 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 uh, and, and, and he himself, let me say, I mean, I, I believe this is very sincere in his part. He believes God helped him because he was, uh, when he was younger, he was, he was drinking a lot. And uh, uh, he, came to, he came to understand this is not a way to live. This is not a way to be a father and a husband. Uh, God changed his heart. And so he really, I, I've seen him uh, talking with, uh, uh, with people who are uh, uh, alcoholics and addicts or ex-alcoholics and ex-addicts. And, and uh, uh, they have a shared story in a way. Even mm -hmm. though he grew up wealthy, they grew up poor. Mm -hmm. They they have they had the same problem mm -hmm. exactly. with with addiction. Yeah. yeah. And and they changed. Um, so I was very hopeful. Uh, I mean, he and I talked, and uh, uh, he had a number of good plans to to propose. Um, one of which was sort of my my favorite plan that uh, uh, when it comes to taxes, uh, uh, Christians or or Jews or Muslims or others. Uh, if they have a charitable program uh, that they that they believe helps the poor more than the governmental program, mm -hmm. which which just about everyone has, everyone yeah. knows of a program like that sort of that sort, they should be able to take part of the money that they pay in taxes and give that directly mm -hmm. to the to the group, uh, and then receive a, a a tax credit. So they would be they would be paying sending less money to Washington in taxes and being able to spend more Almost money the in their own communities. Yeah. For groups that they that they uh, that they think that they think are helpful, mm -hmm. uh, and again that they think are helpful, they know are helpful. I've visited uh, several hundred of these around the United States, and I've seen that they are much more effective in helping poor people mm -hmm. than the governmental programs. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the the plan for a, a charity tax credit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, once he got to Washington, other priorities took place and never happened, mm -hmm. uh, which is to me a tragedy also because I think that would be very very helpful and very mm -hmm. effective. So, uh, I mean, that's a way to, uh, to uh, over time, uh, help the charitable sector of the, of, of, the, of the society do more and the governmental society would do less. Mm -hmm. And I think the charitable group, uh, uh, through churches especially, would be much more effective. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we have, uh, you know, we have evangelicals, we have Catholics, we have Jews, we have Muslims. I think you'd want to do this on an across-the-board basis mm -hmm. uh, so everyone would be able to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a diversity of religions and uh, we would we would work with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the the largest beneficiary of this would be would be poor people, mm -hmm. uh, and I think particularly people who would be helped by churches. Mm -hmm. Given given uh, the United States is still a more is a more church society than yeah. than, than the UK yeah, is about, at this point. We're about a generation or two so, ahead of you guys in terms of yeah. Uh, well, that's right. Secularization that's right. and yeah. So and I don't know. I, I mean, occasionally of uh, back in in two thousand. Uh, uh, some uh, 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 conservatives uh, in London uh, were following what uh, what uh, uh, 
George W. Bush was doing. This was called Compassionate Conservatism in the United States. And they became very interested in this and came over in the summer of 2000 and talked with a lot of members of the shadow cabinet at that point. Uh, uh, and they were very interested in this. I, I don't think anything is really, is, I, I'm not sure what's, mm -hmm. what's come about it, but uh, uh, yeah, there was, there was a time back in uh, when things were not, were not uh, in, in Washington, um, uh, things were not going all that well in the, uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, uh, and I was very hopeful that, uh, that, that London would be, would be doing better and then we would be looking to London for what, uh, what happens. I don't, I don't know if that's been the case. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> afraid not. You know, because, because once, you have, once you have government doing a lot, then you have, uh, you have people in government who really want to maintain what they're doing and then, and then many among, among the poor. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, if, if it's the government taking um, the responsibility above the church, it means that the number one need is not met, which is the spiritual need as well. Yeah, it's a, yeah it just doesn't happen. Uh, and, you know, in the United States, sometimes uh, there are some pastors who are worried that uh, if churches do more in, in, in charity, that's going to hurt even evangelistic efforts. I think, I think from everything I've seen, exactly the opposite is true, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, when when, uh, when there are affluent people who sometimes feel uh, that, their, that their worship is empty, they just have an emptiness inside, uh, and then they see the way they can be helpful with poor people, it, it, it helps them, it animates them, and then among the poor, they see it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, uh, a, a Christian uh, preaching and saying, well, I'm not gonna help you at all really materially, I'm just gonna give you this, and, and you, know, you find, you find your own food, you forage, be fed. Uh, yeah. uh, James and others uh, talk about this in the, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a big debate, isn't there, in America um, in the last few years that I've not read too much about, but particularly to focus on social justice. Right, and, and, and social justice has, uh, has different meanings. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, uh, the United States in the in the early 1900s had a had a big social gospel movement, yeah. uh, which often uh, became pretty uh, uh, desacralized. It, it became uh, uh, highly secularized at times, and and a lot of a lot of people in churches were came. A lot of evangelicals came to fear mm -hmm. social gospel, saying it's just going to take people away yeah, from the gospel, focus on yeah. Christ. But when done properly, when social justice is done properly. Mm -hmm. Uh, spiritual and material, and, and all within the context of uh, of, of a church, uh, mm -hmm. it's it's very important. Mm -hmm. So, I am a, I am a believer in social justice in some ways. I'm 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 a critic of it in other ways because uh, yeah. uh, people use the term in different in different mm -hmm. ways. But but the basic impulse that as Christians we we are to be generous. Uh, you know, when 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 we were God's enemies, God God uh, came to us mercifully. Uh, when we, we should, I mean, we should be going out uh, mm -hmm. among the poor mm -hmm. uh, and, and saying, uh, you know, we, we want to come alongside you, uh, we want to help, uh, you know, do not, do not think of us as just the people who, who can give you stuff. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to help you use the talents God has given you. I mean, we've seen this for, I mean, I'll just give you examples of it, uh, um, that uh, a lot of, a lot of churches wanting to be very charitable uh, would, uh, would organize uh, programs at Christmas time or before Christmas to give gifts to children. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being told this story in, in Dallas uh, by a, a Christian group that started doing that and they would have all the, all the children uh, uh, who were often with single moms, but the dads were somewhere around. Mm -hmm. The children would come to their headquarters and the organization would have a party and present the children with presents mm -hmm. and so forth, uh, shiny new fire trucks, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, and they would invite the, uh, the, the parents also, including the fathers who often were not in the home but mm -hmm. were there. And the, you know, one story, the, a, a father of, uh, uh, had bought. He wanted. He still wanted to be involved in the in the life of his child. Mm -hmm. He had bought uh, his child a, a sort of used uh, toy fire truck yeah. and so forth. And uh, he goes to this place and he sees the the shiny new fire truck that the that the rich folks are giving to their child. Mm -hmm. And he embarrassed slinks away. 
That's not yeah. what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this organization changed to a system where they would set up a, a Christmas store with contributed toys mm -hmm. uh, and, and dolls and so forth. And the parents could come to the store and, and shop for, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for uh, 10 cents on the dollar, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to have a very, very inexpensive so the parents could afford it, but still it'd be the parents would be buying it at that point, and then the parents would be giving it to the child. Yeah. And that, that comes alongside the parents mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than supplanting the parents. Uh, so those are the types of things we've learned a little bit. Yeah, that goes along the lines of some of the books we've read at 20 Schemes, a book called When Helping Hurts. Um, yeah, I know, I know the authors of that book. It's a very good book. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that example they use <clears> as well of um, you know, alienating parents or um, hurting the family. If you're trying to help, you're actually hurting right. them. And, <clears> and a lot of Christians would be involved with, uh, have good motivations and want to love people and be generous, but sometimes they don't think through their charitable means and how, they, uh, how they're going about exactly. things. Exactly, exactly. So, um, no, When Helping Hurts is a really fine book. Mm -hmm. And um, um, that's the type of consciousness we have to have in yeah. poverty fighting. We mm -hmm. have to, uh, again, not supplant, not supplant the parents, but, uh, but help the parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you talked about, a lot about charity. Um, and when I think about charity, I think more power church organizations uh, getting involved where maybe the local church isn't involved. Um, what do you think, uh, uh, where do you think the, the United States is and on, on planting gospel churches in, in kind of the poorer areas? Do you think that's a, a focus of church planting in America? Because I know in the UK here, uh, we're trying, one of the reasons we've set up 20 schemes was because a lot of church planting is done in the, in the city center amongst students, but not very often right. done in, amongst the poorer areas. Is yeah. that something similar in America? Something similar. The, uh, uh, the, the two places where most pastors like to plant churches are number one in affluent communities because mm. the money will come in and number two in inner city areas, sometimes with students, but also sometimes in the United States with minority populations of okay. uh, blacks yeah. and Hispanics and so forth. Mm. Uh, those are the two hot areas. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the people who are often left out are um, the people, there, there's a, a, a fine book called uh, Hillbilly Elegy, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, which describes, I think, mm. very accurately what goes on in a lot of uh, uh, poor white areas mm -hmm. that are that are largely unchurched. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not. Uh, they're not the uh, in, in a sense the, the the sexy inner city church yeah. or the affluent suburban church. Uh, there's a desperate need there, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that I think more people in the United States are aware of that now. And there are mm -hmm. now uh, folks, and I know some of them coming out of uh, Reformed theological seminary yeah. and others who are now planting churches in those areas, but mm -hmm. that's been a largely unchurched area. Yeah. So, yeah, the reason, I'm, the reason I'm here right now is because uh, I, had, I had heard about Mez uh, last year. Uh, uh, he, came, he was in the United States and I interviewed him in front yes, of students yeah. and we put this uh, yeah. interview in World Magazine. So uh, here I am to, to actually see, <laughs> see what, uh, what he and, and all of you are doing. See if uh, what he says is actually happening. Well, that's right. check, <laughs> check, checking him out carefully, but, uh, but no, he's, uh, uh, I, 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 I enjoyed the interview very much. He's, he's, he's funny and, uh, um, and, and I think knows what he's talking about. Yeah, and, he does. And, and, and what I'm seeing here uh, so far certainly bears yeah. that out. So I very much appreciate what's going uh, on. How did you hear Mez was originally in the States or how did you hear about Twain Schemes? Um, you know, I really don't remember uh, how I heard initially, but uh, I heard a lot more from, uh, from one of the uh, the students uh, who was an intern with us, uh, okay. uh, of, 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 and uh, um, you know, uh, Savannah actually was an intern here for I guess half yeah. a year or so. She's not coming so. back. She's coming, spend time with us. I think Savannah's going to come and be a ah, full-time gospel back? worker. Yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> but but uh, but she told me about it, mm. and uh, and you know, I I come to uh, to to trust her mm. her analysis. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, would. With what I had read and, and reading, uh, reading a couple of a couple of books from from Mez, and then and then hearing it firsthand from Savannah, mm -hmm. um, so I, I came I came here to actually see for myself. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of parallels, you think, between some of the ministry that Twenty Schemes is doing and stuff that you've written about. Um, was it? Yeah. Seventies, yeah, eighties. When did you? Yeah. The, this this I, I wrote about this. Uh, did the research uh, largely at the end of the of the eighties and. Uh, yeah, and it came out in the, in the 1990s, and, and there's still people who are reading it. I think it's a, it's a useful history of America, um, but I'm, I'm interested in learning more about, uh, about, about this. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
Yesterday, uh, went around uh, uh, Edinburgh with uh, with Andy Murray and, course, and learned yeah. a lot about Thomas Guthrie. Yeah. So he's a Guthrie expert. Yeah, and so <laughs> and so. Uh, in fact, the I think I think uh, uh, one of the chapters of, of this book of mine, the Tragedy of American Compassion, uh, I have a, I have a part on uh, on just what what happened with uh, Thomas Chalmers in mm -hmm. Glasgow and what he tried to do. And so yeah, just seeing the influence then of Chalmers here in Edinburgh uh, uh, with with Guthrie, the Ragged Schools, uh, yeah, very much parallel to uh, in the United States in the uh, uh, starting in the in the 1830s there was a uh, uh, a fellow who had been uh, uh, a uh, seminary student uh, at Yale named uh, named John McDowell, uh, who was who came to New York City and was very much involved in poverty fighting, mm -hmm. and then he was succeeded by by another another Yale graduate named Charles Brace, uh, who uh, first set up there were, in the, in the United States at that point uh, there were uh, lots of uh, newspapers selling for a penny that uh, that homeless children would sell on the streets because they're called newsboys. And uh, Charles Brace, uh, for about 20 years, set up newsboys' homes, uh, where instead of sleeping on the street or in, you know, over grates or in garrets, wherever they could, I mean, they could actually come there and uh, uh, gain some ragged school training and, mm -hmm. and live there. Uh, and then that wasn't quite sufficient, so Charles Brace set up a, a system where these children uh, could be could be adopted by people living in agricultural areas. And so these were orphan trains. Mm -hmm that uh, would take children from the slums of New York City into upstate New York and then all across the country, all the way even to the Pacific Coast in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I've met people who are the descendants of kids who came to Oregon uh, on orphan trains. Mm -hmm. And they also went into Canada and so forth. So there were about uh, 70,000 children placed over 20 years uh, in homes. And uh, you know they went back and checked and saw what happened. And there were a few, a few cases where the kids were not treated well, but 98% of them, the, the kids, grew up, uh, they, they, they were educated, they worked on the farms, so it was a good deal for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then they became uh, governors and senators and business executives and, and highly successful, mm -hmm. uh, both, in, both in enterprise and in churches. Mm -hmm. uh, they became pastors and elders and deacons. So, uh, you know, here's one person, Charles Brace, mm -hmm. from the 1830s up to the 1870s, mm -hmm. uh, had an enormous influence on, on tens of thousands of lives. So that's the, that's the history in the U.S. Uh, and there's a parallel history here with, mm -hmm. with people like uh, Guthrie and others. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just interested in learning more about, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, Scottish mm -hmm. uh, Christian charity history. Yeah, and Andy Murray's the guy to, to, yeah. to, to speak to because he's, he's written a book on Guthrie and that's really, yeah. really helpful to understand a little bit more of the, the history because yeah, so they, they were here before we were 200 years ago yeah. doing the and same so kind of things that we... Yeah. We're to do. yeah, and in world, uh, we have every year we have a uh, uh, hope award for effective compassion that we give to Christian charitable organizations. We have articles on groups, and so there'll be uh, there'll be an article on twenty schemes in uh, in world sometime this summer that mm -hmm. I'll that I'll write based on what uh, what I'm seeing here. Mm -hmm. And after the um, interview with Mez, did you get good? Feedback from that? Were there people who pushed back and said they didn't really like it? Or oh, the the feedback I got from that was tremendous because uh, um, Mez um, um, was, was just so amusing. You know, he would uh, uh, I, I I I have a PhD, and so he'd say, "Hey, Doc." And so, forth. <laughs> so, uh, so our readers enjoyed seeing that, and uh, and he was very uh, um, you know very very direct, very very folksy. Uh, so it was, it was a real pleasure to interview him. I think uh, the students uh, at Patrick Henry College where I interviewed him, I mean, mm -hmm. they were listening intently, but also mm -hmm. laughing at times. Yeah, yeah. He, I can he, see he, that he when very, I listen to it. He yeah. was very funny. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, it was great. And, and the, the reaction from readers was, uh, yeah, we want to know more about this guy, and we want to know about 20 schemes. Mm -hmm. uh, even the word scheme, you know. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. A, uh, it's a wonderful word. In the, in the United States, mm. it means something very different, yeah, yeah. something nefarious <laughs> and uh, tricky. And, and the outside and, of Scotland, it would mean that as well. Really? But, <laughs> but I, I, I like this. I like, I like the word schemes. Uh, so, yeah. Mm. Good. Well, we're glad to have you over. We're going to um, have a look around the area, aren't we? And oh, I do. I want to just walk around Italy. with you and talk uh, a little bit more and see. Schemes. And, um, no, it, it, it's. Um, uh, uh, the, I mean, both Scotland and the United States, we, we desperately need God's grace. Mm -hmm. We've both, uh, uh, both fallen a, a long way. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when I look at the history of the church, uh, it's, it's a roller coaster. Of course. So, yeah. uh, um, 
you know, there's 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 lots of hope here. For, yeah, and uh, for time to come again, you see the Lord moving amongst the poor, church being planted, people being converted, and revival happening from the yeah. bottom to the top. Uh, yeah, we visited yesterday uh, John Knox's house, or at least the house where he was at the end of his life, and uh, uh, there was one statement from him about the the importance of uh, of helping the poor. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, I'm interested in, in seeing what came out of that, uh, what there was in the uh, in the 18th century, and then I'm, I'm learning more about uh, about Chalmers and Guthrie, uh, and yeah, and 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 uh, it'll be interesting uh, uh, that perhaps uh, you know 100 years or 200 years from now there'll be an historian who will uh, who will who will say, oh, there was Andy, and here's what he did, and here's Mez, but here's what he did, and here are other mm -hmm. other people. So. Uh, yeah, it's uh, some someday what we what what we or what you are doing right now will will be history, and and people will look back at it and say, ah, oh, hope we can yeah. learn something. From yeah, we can, learn, <laughs> we can learn something. Maybe That's one right. or one or two small things. That's right. From the, we can learn from the good old days of, of 2019. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's a pleasure being here. Yeah, it's good to have you. So that book you you wrote just so, so people. Oh can well, check that, it out. that book it's called the tragedy of American compassion. Check that out. And, uh, and then yeah. the two books that we mentioned, Hillbilly Energy. Yeah. It's a good book to read. Yeah, and, and when helping hurts. Helping yeah. hurts. Yeah. And the uh, the equivalent of the non-Christian equivalent of Hillbilly Elegy is Poverty Safari in Scotland. If you haven't read that, it's a really oh. good book. Oh. Check that out. I'll read as well. that. Yeah. Well, good to have you, Marvin. Good. I look forward to good. getting to Thank you. Any more. All right.